Good evening, you're watching Nadu on ITN. We live in a world, we live in a country where the public is vigilant and alert. We as members of the media cannot ignore that fact. This is why on Nadu, we expose the issues which are of national significance, which are of public interest. And it's our duty to educate the people and give an opportunity for the people who are responsible for uh, social, political and economic landscapes in this country. Today we have invited a very, very special person whose name is very well known, whose name has been repeatedly mentioned in the House, at the Parliament. He is Mr. Arjuna Mahendra. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening, Mahesh. Mr. Mahendra, you are in the center of a very, very uh, critical environment. Yes. There's a lot of criticism surrounding you as the governor of the central bank. Yes. You are the man who's responsible for, who takes brunt of responsibilities in seeing proper monetary policies are happening in this country. Before I get into that, I would like to get to know about you. I would like to give an opportunity to our audience to know about you. Tell me your first name. Tell me your full name. Lakshman Arjuna Mahendran. I was born to a Sri Lankan diplomat who mm -hmm. has served in the Sri Lanka Foreign Service for 35 years. So I uh, traveled as a child with my parents, but, uh, uh, but from the age of 10, I was educated in Sri Lanka. I Where did you here. study at? I studied at Royal Junior School and then at Royal College. Uh -huh. uh, I stayed Your here. Your tertiary education? My tertiary education was in the University of Oxford in the UK. Uh -huh. uh, I left, uh, I did my A-levels in 1977 and then I left in 78 to the UK. I studied there for three years, got my degree, came back and I joined the Central Bank of Sri Lanka in 1983. Didn't you get an opportunity to enter to a public university in Sri Lanka? I got an opportunity, but of course I got a scholarship from the University of Oxford, so I took the scholarship and I went abroad. So from Oxford, you came back to Colombo? That's right. What was your first job? First job was, uh, I worked in the Mahaveli Authority as an economist mm -hmm. for about one and a half years, but my main uh, application was to Central Bank of Sri Lanka, where I uh, got an opportunity to meet with the then Deputy Governor, Dr. Nivil Karnatilakar, mm -hmm. who invited me to sit the examination and enter the central bank as a staff officer. How old are you now? I'm now 55 years old. How many years you have lived in Sri Lanka before you moved to Singapore? I lived in Sri Lanka till 2004, uh, till before I moved to Singapore. So roughly about 40 years in this country. You have a lot of friends and your family, your relatives in Sri Lanka? I have my parents are still uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I have cousins and uh, uh, various uh, parts of my family, both in Colombo and in Jaffna and in Kandy. So I am very well established in this country. Have and I consider myself a Sri Lankan. Have you traveled the every nook and corner in this country? I have be, uh, been to every nook and corner of this country. As I said, I worked for the Mahavali Authority, which was, I think, the time when I really got to travel around Sri Lanka. We were doing a lot of projects at that time, Kotmale, uh, Victoria. We were doing in, uh, the, some of the Madhuroya projects. So I've been to the Batiklo district. And of course, we were also looking at Giant's Tank at that time, which was going to provide irrigation to the northern part of the country. Uh -huh. I've also been down south looking at uh, projects like Lunugam uh -huh. So I have really, I think, seen most of the country and I know a lot about Sri Lanka. Well, now I have a question how people can call him. He is not a Sri Lankan. Who are your parents? My parents, Mr. C. Mahendran, he was uh, in the Sri Lanka Foreign Service. He served, as I said, for 35 years in, in the Foreign Service. My mother also was a graduate of the University of Peradena, like my father. Uh, the, both of them, uh, you know, have uh, served this country for, for their whole lifetimes. And they still continue to do so, even though they're retired. You know, they help uh, in various social activities and, and such like. So I, I consider myself, you know, a Sri Lankan. Uh, now, you mentioned that, uh, I think, in the context that it has been alleged that I am a foreigner. Well, let's get on to that topic later. Yes. Now, 11 years, you had a, count, uh, you had a total uh, of about 11 years working at the central bank as a, as a senior economist. That's right. Uh, uh, during that 11 years, uh, were you a Sri Lankan? I was a Sri Lankan, indeed. I have uh, been a Sri Lankan and, uh, uh, you know, I, I am vitally interested in this country. And uh, during that 11 years, I not only worked in the central bank, I was released to work with the Ministry of Finance um, in the Fiscal Policy Department, where I was made a director. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I also worked in the Ministry of Industry, Science and Technology, as it was known at that time. 
which was uh, where I was invited to work by Mr. A.S. Jayavadana, uh -huh. who was a former governor of the Central Bank, who at that time uh, was on release uh -huh. from the Central Bank. He invited me to come and work with him in the Ministry of Industries. When did you, when did you start working at Central Bank in your 11 years of uh, continuous service? To 1983 Bank? was 83. when I joined. 83? Yes. Uh, under uh, how many governments you worked there? I was working in 1983. Obviously, the UNP government was in power at that time. And uh, that uh, government continued till 1993. Uh -huh. uh, and in 1994, there was a change of government when uh, uh, Her Excellency Chandrika Kumaratunga became the president. I worked briefly under that government and then I uh, moved into the private sector. Uh -huh. I left the central bank. You moved to private sector. That's right. Well, uh, Mr. Mahendran, now, as we have heard that one of the allegations uh, apart from technical allegations, yes. is that you are not a Sri Lankan. Yes. You are a Singaporean citizen, even on Wikipedia, even on uh, online uh, websites, uh, yes. they refer to you as a Singaporean citizen. What are the reasons for you to forfeit your Sri Lankan citizenship? You being a person who loves the mother country, who loves the motherland, why did you decide to become a Singaporean citizen? Was it on a, on a, on a work requirement or or because of the threats or because of a precarious situation that you faced and you had to leave the country? So in 2001, Mahesh, I was invited to be chairman of the BOI. Mm. Uh, and I worked in the BOI for about almost two and a half years. In uh, May 2004, as you know, the government uh, changed. And uh, I uh, submitted my resignation to President Chandrika Kumaratunga, which he accepted. And then I was looking for a job in Sri Lanka and it was very difficult to find a job. Because, as you know, the UNP government uh, had lost power and I was uh, being in such a high profile position as Chairman BOI, uh, I was identified with the United National Party, uh, even though I tried to do the, my work, you know, as objectively as possible. But, you know, the private sector in this country is very reluctant to give uh, uh, positions to people who have been, you know, in, in so-called political types oh. of roles. Oh. Uh, so, uh, after trying for a while to set up a small business or even to join any company which was not successful, I thought I will go to Singapore mm -hmm. and look for work. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate enough to get a job immediately with a Swiss bank that was doing business in, in Singapore. And um, that uh, was the time when, you know, uh, we were finding it difficult to uh, promote Sri Lanka overseas because of the political animosity that was being... Uh, uh, target ag against some of us. For instance, I have uh, on record uh, comments by, uh, you know, the late uh, J. Raj Fernando Pule, for instance, who alleged that I was uh, working, he called me a Malaysian citizen in those comments, you know, in the Hansard, uh -huh. saying that I was uh, helping the UNP to link, have links with uh, uh, so-called Tamil extremists overseas. Uh -huh. And uh, then these comments were also repeated by Honorable Dallas uh, Alaperuma. Uh, later on in the media, uh, mentioning my name and saying that, you know, I was part of this conspiracy by the UNP to try and bring in uh, some sort of overseas elements to aid and abet the, the Tamil Tiger cause, which is all completely uh, spurious. Mr. Mahendran, yes. are you a UNP activist? Are you a UNP member or a professional who has worked under the UNP government? I am a professional who has worked under the UNP government. I have never undertaken any political activity. I have never stood for election or been inclined to really in, engage in any form of politics. But of course, I, I have no, make no secret of the fact that I have been a, a supporter of uh, UNP governments. That is my belief. Well, what are the, what are the immediate reasons for you to leave the country and become a Singaporean citizen? So, um, one thing you probably know, Mahesh, is that the Singapore government has for several decades, under their great leader Lee Kuan Yew, encouraged uh, professionals, foreign professionals, to come and work in Singapore and become citizens. Mm. That has been a conscious policy of that country mm. because they want uh, people to basically uh, enrich the quality of education and professional services in Singapore uh, by getting good foreign talent. We have a lot of people from Sri Lanka in the old days, Ceylon. For instance, we had doctors, we had lawyers who went to Singapore in the old days and created that society. And that uh, country still continues that tradition. Mm -hmm. They are very open to foreigners coming and working there. So what uh, happened to me was when I went and started working in 2004, within a few years, the government of Singapore uh, made an offer 
uh, they send you a letter saying that, you know, please, would you like to become a citizen of this country? Oh. Now, as I said, you know, I was having all these uh, uh, sort of allegations being made against me in Sri Lanka by very senior politicians, which uh, was disturbing me. And uh, I thought that, you know, the, since the Singapore government was warmly welcoming me, you know, maybe I should take that opportunity. And of course, there's the other element, which was that if I refuse that offer, I was worried that maybe I may lose my job also uh. and I may re become unemployed. Uh. So that's one of the reasons why I accepted the citizenship. Uh, you know, it was that, that combination of events that, that led me to make that decision. Well, you decided that rather than uh, facing the political uh, revenge or political uh, the consequence of working with the UNP government. That's right. You find your own bread and butter yes. and find a safe place and be a decent citizen and continue your good work. Exactly. Well, in the Asian region and even in the world, in the financial arena, you are identified as uh, investment strategist. Yes. What are the testimonies you have uh, to justify that? So I have worked with some of the biggest banks in the world. Um, for example, I worked with uh, a Swiss bank called Credit Suisse. Uh, which is very well known. Then I also worked with a Hong Kong bank called HSBC, which also has branches in Sri Lanka and has been in Sri Lanka for over 150 years. So these are large international banks. And what I have done in those banks is I have managed uh, their customers' money uh, in terms of their pension funds or other types of investments and made those investments grow. That was my major job as an investment strategist. Most latterly, I went to Dubai and I worked for the National Bank of Dubai where again I was uh, the chief investment officer looking over a portfolio of over $200 billion that was invested in various types of uh, uh, activities. So my specialization is to uh, manage investments, to manage money. Uh -huh. That is something I have acquired over the last 30 years of my career. Uh, does it require the expertise of economists? It does, because economists have the unique ability to look at the big picture in global markets you have to know what uh, governments are doing in terms of their uh, fiscal policy and then what central banks are doing in terms of monetary policy, how exchange rates are moving all the time. You know, you have to factor all these uh, elements into the total investment picture and then you create what's called an asset allocation. And from that asset al allocation, you explain to your customers how you see the world. Mm -hmm. And if they then uh, get confidence that you can manage their money properly, then they will give you their savings, their hard-earned savings to, uh, to manage. So that is my, has been my business. Well, before you became the, uh, the CBSL governor, the governor yes. of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, what was your previous job? So before I became governor, I was the chief investment officer of the largest bank in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the name of the bank is Emirates NBD. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was a very senior position in that bank, which uh, basically manages uh, investment funds, uh, not only for ordinary customers of the bank, but for large government institutions and even for the government itself. What, what made you to give up a lucrative post that you enjoyed in the UAE and accept the post of governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka? Well, very plain and simple, I still consider myself a Sri Lankan after all these years, even though I had to take up uh, foreign citizenship. And uh, basically, I, I felt that it was a call of duty. Uh, when your country asks you to come, you have to go. That is, I, I have, uh, you know, uh, always believed that that is the case. As I say, my father was a civil servant uh, in, in the foreign service. Uh, my grandparents also worked for the government of Sri Lanka. So we have a tradition of working for the government of the Sri Lanka to try and uplift the country. So I considered it a duty. Well, most of, uh, most of us Sri Lankans, we know economists are found in the central bank. Yes. But there was a time that we heard that economists uh, had to be hired from overseas. Yes. One chief consultant and economist was hired at a uh, mammoth rate of uh, five, uh, 500,000 US dollars a month mm -hmm. because we didn't have a senior economist in the bank mm -hmm. who was capable enough to uh, steer uh, the central bank towards the next level. You as an economist, do you think that you have enough expertise and the experience and the exposure mm -hmm. to occupy this hot seat? Well, I, 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 I'm too humble to say that I know everything, but I think I certainly have enough experience to hold my own with, uh, you know, any of the policymakers in Sri Lanka or even abroad. Uh, and as you know, the job of the central bank is to manage the government's money, to raise money for the government and to ensure that there's financial stability in the banking system and in the broader financial system and to see that inflation is kept under control. Those are our main objectives. 
Uh, and to do that, I think I have sufficient experience. I have managed, as I told you, several hundreds of billions of dollars for foreign banks. So I think from that experience perspective, I can do this job fairly effectively. If you were not given this job, you would have continued in the UAE? Yes, I could have continued in the UAE or in Singapore. Well, now we get on to the hot topic. Yes. That's the allegations uh, targeting you. Yes. There were so many allegations that uh, came out during the past three months. Mr. Mahendran, don't you regret of accepting this offer of becoming the governor? You have been the center of criticism. We know your credibility. We have heard about your credibility. We have heard about your expertise. Don't you regret that you have become a victim of the polarized political system in this country? Don't you regret? I don't regret it at all. There are two points I want to make. First, this uh, criticism against me has come mainly from some sections of the local media. When you look at the international business press, there has not been one single article carried about this so-called uh, misappropriation or whatever allegation is being made against me. The second point I want to make, when you bring about change, there is always resistance. And I think this uh, situation is all about change. We had to make a big change in the way that government bonds were being issued by the central bank on behalf of the government of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. In the process of that change, certain people, politicians, business people, were affected. Mm -hmm. And they, I think, were behind this, this criticism. Well, Mr. Mahendra, now we have heard as media persons, we, we got to know in 2010, 2011, 2012, yes. similar, similar treasury bonds, government bonds were issued. And in 2007, uh, Central Bank uh, acquired, uh, uh, resorted to commercial borrowings uh, at a very high rate uh, uh, to the tune of about 500 million US dollars. At that time, the public were not even aware of these treasury bonds. We, we never knew. Yes. Later, through our investigations, we found even certain treasury bonds were not auctioned with the due process were not publicly auctioned some private parties were privileged to purchase these uh, uh, treasury bonds yes. so in in your term as you become the governor now we have got to know about these treasury bonds what is this difference why 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 did it happen i mean during the previous regime mm -hmm. common man layman yeah. we didn't know about treasury bonds uh, there was no reference to it but it had happened you see uh, the previous regime from what i can see was very keen on controlling everything as you know, the government sector expanded. Most of the investment that was being undertaken was being done by the government uh, in terms of infrastructure, etc. And uh, as a result, the private sector really was not allowed to thrive. And part of the way of trying to control the system was to control interest rates. Interest rates are a very important component of how the economy functions, as you know, my yes. Now, one way of trying to control interest rates is to control the treasury bond auctions and the treasury bill auctions by not having a public auction but by uh, setting the rates uh, secretly through private transactions. Uh -huh. Nowhere in the world in any developed bond market does the majority of transactions in a bond market take place privately. Mm. It never happens. Yes. Right? And in our own central bank public debt manual, it says very explicitly that all the sales of government treasury bonds in the primary market should be done as far as possible through auctions. Mm. This has not happened in Sri Lanka. Well, what is the correct procedure? What should be the correct process in marketing government bonds? The correct uh, procedure, which is outlined in the Central Bank Public Debt Manual, is that auctions should be announced on a, by, way of, uh, by, by way of newspaper advertisements or advertisements on the Central Bank website mm -hmm. or any other type of uh, media uh, so that the public should be made aware of what is being made of a, uh, brought an offer to the public. Secondly, it should be done regularly so that the public and particularly the specialists who invest in these type of securities are able to predict when these auctions will take place. And thirdly, it should be done in a transparent manner where the prices that are bid in those auctions are made publicly available. Mm -hmm. Now, none of those have been followed in Sri Lanka, regrettably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have had very sporadic auctions, very few. For instance, in 2014, the last auction was held, I think, somewhere in September. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, there were no auctions at all mm -hmm. in the whole of the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is regrettably a practice that uh, does not 
lend itself to transparency mm -hmm. and also to the effective conduct of monetary policy. Monetary policy is about the flow of money through the economy. If you don't have proper auctions which set proper market related interest rates, the movement of money through the economy will be affected. No proper procedure had been followed according to Mr. Mahendran and we never heard about bond issues uh, before, uh, the, uh, uh, before the assumption of duties by Mr. Mahendran uh, because uh, apparently process and the procedures had not been followed. Let's take a short break. I'll be right back on the other side. Welcome back. This is Nadu. I represent you. I represent the public. I'm questioning Governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Arjuna Mahendra. Mr. Mahendra, now the controversy surrounding you was the issuance of the Treasury bonds. Can you tell us the background, the reasons for the decision to issue the Treasury bond after you assuming duties? What were the requirement? Okay, so Mahesh, you get uh, treasury bonds of different uh, maturities. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the longest one is 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we decided when I became governor, I became governor on the 23rd of January. Mm -hmm. uh, in February, I uh, proposed to the monetary board, which is the main decision-making body of the central bank, that we start the auctions, which we hadn't had for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, they agreed. But so the last time we had an auction? The last time we had an auction was, I think, in late December 2014. That was a very small auction, but before that, the prior one had been in September mm -hmm. uh, 2014. So okay. they were very irregular. All right. So I said we must now have regular auctions. Mm -hmm. And uh, earlier, over 90% of the issues of uh, bonds were done privately, mm -hmm. and less than 10% were done through auctions. I said this is all wrong. Does that does that warrant? Does that uh uh, does the system give uh, permission or any allowance to do so? No, it does not. The manual says that you must do it as much as possible through auctions. So how, how could have that happened? Well, I think uh, previous uh, you know, managements of the central bank have felt that they want to control interest rates and maybe create an artificial situation of interest rates and thereby you know, uh, control the economy. Was it the, only, was it the only reason? Control the economy or did they want to entertain... Uh, any henchmen or did they want to entertain any parties known to them? We have to investigate that, Mahesh. I don't want to make any allegations, you know, on public uh, television about this. But definitely there is room for those types of malpractices if you have a system which is uh, very secretive and which is controlled away from the gaze of the public. That is something we have to investigate, but we have to do that thoroughly before coming to a conclusion. Right, understood. So please explain to us the reasons for this, the recent Treasury bond. So the recent Treasury bond, I suggested to the Monetary Board that we should have an auction. Very mm -hmm. simple. So that was advertised. Mm -hmm. The decision was taken on the 23rd of February and an advertisement was placed on our website on the 25th of February stating that we will issue 30-year uh, Treasury bonds at an interest rate of 12.5%. Mm -hmm. That advertisement came on the website and in the newspapers. On the 26th Did of February. Did it mention 12.5? It mentioned 12.5% very clearly. Then the allegation or the hue and cry about that it was not mentioned is, is false. Or? That is completely false. It was mentioned. I can bring you a copy of that advertisement and show you today. Okay. Now, uh, why did you all want to ta do that, uh, the carry out that treasury bond or the auction? Yes. Uh, what are the urgent requirement? We heard that there was an urgent requirement to uh, restart the construction of uh, hi highways and so on and so forth. Is That's that right. true? That is true. As you know, the Honorable Minister of Finance on the 29th of January announced a budget, a mini budget, mm. in which he raised the government sector salaries by about 40%. So that itself had already raised the amount of money that the uh, Ministry of Finance needed. So the, the duty of the central bank, one of our functions, what we call an agency function, which is peculiar to the Sri Lanka central bank, is that we have to raise debt on behalf of the government. Now that is the agency function. That is not something the central bank can question. When the Ministry of Finance and the Treasury orders us to raise say 13.5 billion rupees on the 2nd of March 2015, we have to do it somehow or the other. Mm. We can't question that, mm. right? So that is the context. So we had advertised this auction on the 27th of February, which was the last working day before the 2nd of March, mm. when we had to deliver 13.5 billion rupees to the Ministry of Finance. Mm. Now, on the Friday, the 27th of uh, February, mm. when I 
discussed with the, uh, the public debt uh, department officials, we found that we had only raised 3.5 billion. Oh. The request was for 13.5 billion. Mm -hmm. So there was a gap of 10 billion. 10 billion. So we discussed amongst ourselves. I discussed with the officials. I said, how can we raise 10 billion? We have only one working day left. Mm. So they said there is an auction taking place. And uh, let us uh, see whether we can raise this money through that auction. Because the private placements that they were expecting did not materialize. Which means, Mr. Mahendran, you did not take the decision on your own. I did not take the decision on my own. It was a collective decision by all the senior management of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. All the management of the monetary board. The monetary board gave us the permission to have the auction and to resort to an auction method as far as possible. But then the monetary board does not get involved in the actual execution of the policy. That is done by the senior management. Mm. Myself, the deputy governors, the uh, relevant employees of the public debt department are the people who get involved in that through what is called a tender committee process. Well, once you announce the auction, what are the other initiatives that should be followed? What are the, uh, the procedure? What is the procedure? So the procedure is you announce uh, through an advertisement the terms of the auction. So like I said, uh, the, we asked for the bids for 1 billion rupees of uh, bids for a, at uh, interest rate of 12.5%. And the delivery of that money would be the 2nd of March 2015. Those terms are uh, spelled out in the advertisement and uh, the only entities that can bid in this auction are a group of uh, companies called primary dealers. Primary dealers and the EPF and the NSB asset management because those are two large, large government entities who also manage money. Those are the only entities that can bid at these auctions. Mm. So we basically call for bids on that date and uh, on the 27th of February and then the procedure is that the bids are closed at 11 a.m. and then they are listed in the order of the rate of interest where each bidder makes his bid. Oh. So in other words, if you are asking for uh, uh, say 12.5 percent, somebody may bid at 11.5 or 8.5 or 9.5. You see, they can bid at whatever price they feel that the government will accept. Mm. And then the tender committee will go and evaluate those bids and award it to uh, whichever bids they feel are appropriate. Mm -hmm. That's how that the, is the, the procedure. Process, procedure takes place. That's right. Now, uh, uh, why didn't you resort to a short-term uh, method of uh, tool of uh, treasury bills Yes, if there was urgent requirement? So we already had issued treasury bills. Mm. Every Tuesday, there is a treasury bill auction mm. conducted by the central bank. Mm -hmm. But the thing with treasury bills, uh, Mahesh, is that there is a limit to how much we can issue because they are very short term. Short term. They are either 3, 6 or 12 months in yes. terms of uh, tenor. Now, you don't want to, for instance, invest in a road, which where the, uh, the tolls from the road will, you know, take many years to repay the construction costs of that road. You don't want to finance that with short term instruments like treasury bills, where there's a mismatch. One of the principal rules of uh, banking and finance is that you must match your assets and your liabilities. Mm. So here your liability is the, what you are borrowing from the public. And if you go and borrow short term to fund a long term project, you will end up in difficulties because what may happen is over the long term, you may not raise enough money to f uh, repay those uh, borrowings that you have made in the short term. Why 30 years instead of a short term? So we have already issued 30 year bonds in the past. Mm. There is what you call a yield curve. That is uh, different maturities of bonds are issued to the public. Mm. You see, there are the public also needs uh, bonds of different maturities. Say if you are an insurance corporation or a pension fund where your uh, customers require their money to be repaid in 20, 30 years time when they retire. Mm. then you need an instrument that will give you that opportunity to uh, get those returns in 30 years' time. Mm. That is why we issue 30-year bonds. Mm. In fact, in other countries, they go up to 50 years, sometimes even to 99 years. Mm. So that 
process of the financial market evolution in Sri Lanka has now advanced to the point where we can go up to 30 years. Could you give me some examples of such countries which has gone uh, up to 50 years or 99 years? United States, uh, the UK, United Kingdom, all the big European countries, Italy, Germany, France, Japan. Uh, all these countries have uh, very sophisticated bond markets in Asia, China. Uh, China has a 50-year bond. Singapore has a 99-year bond, which they use to fund their very superior housing, public housing projects. Uh, Malaysia has several bonds, again, of several maturities up to 99 years. Again, funding long-term projects. You can't fund a long-term project with short-term bonds. That is bad finance. Mm -hmm. And that is why the government of Sri Lanka also should be issuing long-term uh, bonds so that we can fund long-term infrastructure. That is very essential. Well, but I, what I fathom from your statement, from your answer, is that you all have uh, somewhat tried to bring in some novelty yes. and some uh, uh, sophistication to the uh, bond market, yes. but it has sort of backfired on you all. Well, like I said, change is something that a lot of pe some people don't like because it changes the way people make profits. And, you, you take know, it as a backfiring? or I think that there definitely was a backfiring considering the huge reaction that we saw. Uh, where, you know, certain vested interests, both in the political sphere as well as in the business sphere, were reacting against this change that we brought about. This happened once before. I'll give you an example, Mahesh. Way back in 1993, when I was working for Mr. A.S. Javadana and Mr. Ranil Vikram Singh in the Industries Ministry, we proposed the opening of the share market. The Colombo Stock Exchange at that time restricted ownership only to Sri Lankan nationals mm. and residents. What we proposed in that year, in 93, was we opened the market to foreign investors. There was a huge backlash, very similar to what happened this time. And the reason is, there were vested interests in that market who were threatened, who felt that foreigners will come and buy all their stakes and push up the prices and make life uncomfortable for them. Mm -hmm. And this is a similar situation. So I have been there before. And this time again, we undertook the change. I consulted the Honorable Prime Minister and the, the, all the cabinet ministers, they were aware of this. And I said, we have to make this change because this is for the good of the economy. We oh. have to have a properly functioning market economy if the Sri Lanka is really to develop. Well, Mr. Mahendran, for us, the, for the public, uh, the public servants get their monthly pay pack yes. every month. That's right. And the roads are being built up. Infrastructure programs continue without waste and corruption, as we believe, as, as the good governance, uh, uh, the, the new regime has uh, promised. Yes. Uh, uh, the public are not very much bothered about uh, the treasury bonds or, or the interest rates as long as the economy is, is handled in a proper, transparent, accountable manner. What I'm trying to arrive at is the fact that now the, the, the polarized political system has come out with various allegations and statements. We don't know whether they are false or true. Mm -hmm. Now, one such allegation is that out of this transaction, there is a huge loss of uh, about 40 billion uh, worth of money to uh, the government of Sri Lanka and to this country. Is yes. that true? Uh, that's something the public would not understand. Yes. But the politicians have raised their voice in parliament that there's a huge loss. How can that happen? This is complete nonsense, uh, Mahesh, and I'll tell you why. But a politician cannot come out with such a, uh, such a falsehood. They have come out with a very simplistic story, which is actually totally false. The allegation, as I understand it, is first of all, why did I raise the amount that was raised at the auction from 1 billion to 10 billion? And I will answer that. Secondly, there's a completely false allegation that the money could have been raised at 9.5% and that I have artificially raised this uh, to 12.5%. First of all, I did not do this personally. As I said, it was a collective decision done by a tender board, which I did not participate. Mm -hmm. right? It was collectively done by the top management, the senior management of the central bank and the public debt department, and the tender board acted quite independently of the governor. Mm -hmm. That's the first point I want to make. Second point is, this decision was made because the Ministry of Finance had ordered the central bank to raise 13.5 billion rupees on the 2nd of March, and on the 27th of February, we did not have 10 billion available of mm -hmm. that money. Mm -hmm. It was a Friday. On Monday, we had to deliver the money. We needed 10 billion. And the only option was to resort to this auction, which we had advertised. That was the reason why the amount was raised. When did you identify that 10 billion was, uh, was an urgent requirement and what was that for? That requirement was uh, announced to the central bank one month before. So in early February, the Ministry of Finance wrote to the central bank saying that we have a cash flow requirement of uh, so, uh, so much for the f coming month, for the month of March. 
and in that uh, cash flow requirement was this number 13.5 billion specifically for the th uh, 2nd of March 2015. We had to deliver that money. Now, the central bank and our team were relying on the old system of private placements. They were expecting to raise this 13.5 billion through private placements. But when it came to Friday, the 27th of February, we found that the private placements had only yielded 3.5 billion. Oh. And there was a balance 10 billion which we had to raise. So the only option was then to go through this auction. If you all didn't do that auction, if you all didn't raise, now one of the allegations, one of the main premises of the allegation is that yes. uh, the announced amount was 1 billion and yes. later it was raised to 10 billion. That's right. If it didn't happen, yes. if, it di if, if you all didn't allow the increase of 1 billion to 10 billion, what could have been the repercussions? The repercussions would have been that the Ministry of Finance would not have had money the following week to make payments, whether it was uh, subsidies to tea, uh, tea smallholders or to rubber smallholders or the financing of these highways that we discussed. All those payments would have come to a grinding halt. Already the construction industry was complaining that the government was not giving them enough money to continue with a lot of these projects. So this would have made that situation much worse and we could have seen a situation where a lot of projects may have even just got cancelled. Mm -hmm. which would have affected the economy of the country. Which means at that time, after June, after January 8th, once the new government was formed, yes. that the government coffers were empty. The government coffers were empty. In fact, I'll give you one fact. There was a $500 million bond which had been raised five years pre prior to this, which had to be repaid in January. Yes. The governor of the central bank resigned on the 9th of January or thereabouts, and no plans were left in place to raise money to uh, repay that bond. So we had to actually dig into our reserves and repay that bond and that created a shortage of foreign exchange also mm. in the markets. That was the level of unpreparedness that we had in January when this new government was uh, brought into power. Well, now, uh, throughout the three months of allegations and uh, uh, complaints and uh, certain uh, destructive as well as uh, constructive criticism, uh, you have said that uh, you have denied the fact that your involvement directly or indirectly to the decision making of the bond issuance. But we as the public, you as the governor of the central bank, the person who takes the brunt of responsibilities, how can we believe when you say that you deny the fact that you get involved in decision making because we believe you, in, you get involved in decision making. I did not deny that I was involved in the decision making. That was a collective effort by, with the senior management of the central bank. What I am saying is that I did not uh, favor any particular party in the allocation of the way those bonds were sold to the primary dealers and to the EPF and to other entities. I did not get involved in that part of the decision. Oh. I may have told the, uh, I may have uh, agreed with the rest of the committee that we had to raise the amount that had to be raised at the auction. But in terms of the allocation of those bids, that was done in a scientific manner, technically approved, and the tender committee did its work properly. Oh. And they basically gave me a recommendation, which I also agreed with. Uh, tender committee, does tender committee take the final decision or the public debt department? The tender committee. Tender committee. That's right. They recommend uh, the, uh, the, the successful allocation. allocation. Yes. Well, it is also pointed out that a company uh, which is uh, connected or with which your son is connected uh, profited from this deal. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, that is a fact. 50% uh, of the amount that was uh, sold at that auction went to a particular company. Mm. Now, of course, uh, the committee that looked into this said there was an unusual transaction in the sense that that company had been through a bank. Now, that is being examined by the COPE at the moment, and those uh, deliberations will go on. But the fact of the matter is the tender committee did its work properly because the tender committee's responsibility is to see that the government obtains sufficient funding for its requirements at a, as low a price as possible and in keeping with the monetary policy objectives of the government, which is to see that inflation does not rise and we don't print too much money, etc. So all those aspects were complied with by the tender committee. Mm. To that extent, we were not aware that any particular company had obtained a large share of this uh, particular bond on the day that the bond was awarded. Mm. It's only subsequently that allegation surfaced that there was an unusual transaction mm. between a bank and this company. Mm. That is being investigated now, mm. separately. Yes. Now, at the, at the time of transaction, was your son-in-law a uh, member of the senior management of that company? No. 
He had resigned from that company on the day that I became governor of the central bank. And we heard that uh, it took about a month for the formalities to take place before you assumed duties because your son-in-law had to uh, uh, resign from the company. We, we, we no, he resigned immediately and he notified the public debt department of the central bank. And that notification effectively meant that he was no longer involved with that company. Why did you ask your son-in-law to resign from his lucrative job? I did not ask him. He did it voluntarily. But uh, there was a very perceptible conflict of interest because this was a company that was being supervised by me. But by the same token, if I uh, had my son-in-law working for a bank, which I supervised, again, I would uh, expect that he would resign from that position in the bank so that there is no potential for a conflict. But in addition, if any decision had to be taken with regard to a company in which any relation of mine uh, was involved, I would always recuse myself from having any uh, dealings with that decision and I would leave it to the other members of the monetary board to make that decision. That is the standard procedure in any well-run company and that is how corporate governance is, is uh, effected. So I adhere to all those procedures in this case. Well, we have heard uh, during the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, uh, the transactions between a lot of connected parties uh, took place with the central bank and the other private parties and the, uh, the organizations, be it local or international. Yeah. But, but this issue uh, sprouted out and uh, came out of proportion. Yes. What is the reason for that? As I said, the only reason I can think of is that I brought about a big change in the way this market operated. I moved it towards a more market-friendly type of situation. But that affected certain vested interests who were benefiting from the previous system. Was it a market-friendly approach or was it a... Uh, friends friendly approach well earlier it was a friends friendly approach I think now I was moving towards a market friendly approach where I basically brought about more transparency mm -hmm. and in that process I think there were a lot of people who got affected and they are the ones who made the loudest noise well mr. governor what I understand from uh, many of your answers there had been an air of unpreparedness within the central bank which you cannot deny before you assume duties they were used to a certain way of doing things which was not in line with international best practice. Because in your answer, you pointed out that in order to repay a 500 million bond uh, which was on maturity in January, you all have to use the foreign reserves. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, to settle that, uh, the, uh, the amount that yes. the central bank had to pay. That's so right. it, it's sheer unpreparedness. I would like to point, my point, point the finger at your public debt department. To be fair by them, uh, in, when there is a change of government, and particularly given that uh, this change of government uh, was unexpected in a lot of quarters, including the foreign investors who had invested in our bonds, those foreign investors needed to be reassured that the new government would uh, continue in a broad sense with the policies of the previous government. Of course, with greater transparency and with better corporate governance, etc. And until those policies, the new government's policies were explained, we were unable to implement a rapid uh, replacement of that bond that was expiring. So I won't blame the central bank staff themselves for the lack of preparedness. I would say that in a big political change like what we have had in this country this year, you have to expect these types of dislocations. Uh -huh. But what I'm uh, rather disappointed is that this replacement bond should have been issued before the elections. And I feel that maybe the previous management of the central bank purposely uh -huh. did not do that issuance so that they would create a situation that the new government would find some difficulties. For public, it's like uh, washing your hands off and passing the buck. Possibly. You can characterize it like that. Well, after this incident occurred, uh, after it was raised, especially by the opposing political uh, weaves or po uh, the people who represent the opposing uh, political weaves, uh, you took a decision to resign. Or took a decision to go and leave. Yes. Why did you do that? I wanted to give the inquiring committee complete freedom to go into the central bank and find out whatever they wanted uh, without any allegations that I had somehow blocked or uh, prevented them from accessing information. Mm -hmm. And that was why I went on leave mm -hmm. because I felt that's the proper thing to do. I knew in my conscience and my um, heart that I basically had done nothing wrong. But on the other hand, I needed to show good faith by giving complete unhindered access to the central bank's resources 
for the committee to find out whatever they needed to do. In taking in taking the decision to take a leave, yes. did you did you plan that vacation? Did you plan that leave in the sense like did you go to your office and get your uh, got your files and get get back home? No, I just left the office at, as it was, and I. Uh, uh, informed the Honorable Prime Minister, who is the Minister in charge of the Central Bank, that I was going on leave. And my everything was left as it is. I, I didn't uh, interfere with the office thereafter. A vociferous political uh, a member of the parliament, very vociferous person, uh, came out uh, in public in many rallies and in, in, in press conferences, stated that uh, Arjuna Mahendran is operating from uh, the official uh, the residence. Uh, even though he is not uh, going to work, he is, even though he is not uh, signing in, he is working from uh, from his Nila Nivase or his official uh, residence. residence. Is well, that true? Well, I was uh, uh, living in the official residence and I was uh, there because uh, I had no place. When I came suddenly from overseas, I needed a place to stay. So I, I have been uh, using the official residence, it is true. But I can't see how I can uh, run the central bank from a bungalow, you know, several miles away from the central bank, when all the files and the ledgers and the uh, computer systems and all that are in the head office. Uh, the governor's residence has no connection with those systems. And all the committees are meeting in the head office. Nobody comes uh, to meetings in the, in the governor's residence. Mm -hmm. So I never conducted any meetings. I never met any committees or did anything of the official business while I was on leave. I w went uh, on a uh, holiday outside Colombo and... Uh, uh, you know, I had nothing to do with the central bank in the time I was on leave. Well, uh, there was a three-member committee appointed to probe into this investigation, probe into this issue, and they investigated. And later on, we, we heard that you were uh, exonerated, or rather, they stated that there was no involvement by you, and you have not influenced. May I suggest that you were politically backed up, politically supported? I think the, I have great respect for the gentlemen who man that committee. They have uh, legal careers spanning from 15 to 25 years. I would be very surprised if people of that standing would just whitewash a major crime. Uh, I asked I that question believe. because yes. that was what inculcated in people's mind that uh, Arjuna Mahendran was uh, politically supported. Uh, that's why he got exonerated. Well, uh, some uh, civic conscious citizens... Uh, Again, very respectable people went to the Supreme Court and filed a fundamental rights uh, case against me. Uh, and the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case because they felt that the, the grounds were not uh, sufficient for the case to be made. Uh, so I would uh, basically point you to the Supreme Court, to the, the three uh, uh, you know, honorable uh, lawyers who have uh, looked at this case and uh, ask you to ask that question of them. But as far as I'm concerned, in my mind, I have done nothing wrong and I'm uh, fortunate and uh, I humbly accept the verdict of the Supreme Court and these three lawyers that, uh, you know, so far justice has been done and that nothing has really been done wrong by me. Well, that's the story about the uh, treasury bond issuance, uh, uh, which actually uh, hampered uh, somewhat of uh, the credibility of Mr. Arjuna Mahendran. Uh, we know he is a credible person. He's very well known in the Asian financial circuit and in the whole world. But unfortunately, he had to face uh, this situation uh, due to various factors. Our duty as members of media is to question him and give a public a true picture. Let's take a short break. Welcome back. You're watching Nadu. I'm talking to the Governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Arjun Mahendra. Well, Mr. Mahendra, you explained to us about the Treasury bond issuance and uh, the environment that created uh, the situation. Yes. Uh, will the Central Bank go ahead with uh, further this sort of transaction Treasury bonds? Uh, are you planning to raise funds through Treasury bonds or, uh, or, or has, that, has the previous incident become a, a deterrent? Not at all. As I told you, Mahesh, we have brought about change and I'm happy to report that the change is working. So we have raised record amounts of money in the local markets in the last uh, three or four months since we brought these changes. We have gone to a 100% auction system. No treasury bonds have been issued through private placements since the 27th of February. In the week after the 27th of February, we raised a record 100 billion rupees in three auctions in one week. 
That has never happened before in the history of the central bank. And since then, it has been a continued success. In fact, two weeks ago, uh, we raised $388 million through the issuance of Sri Lanka de development bonds, again in an auction held in Colombo. So these are great achievements, and I congratulate the staff of the central bank and the public debt department in particular for having brought about these changes. They themselves have done this. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, now when you assume duties in February, yes. uh, you as the head of the organization should have definitely done your ABCD or rather done an investigation or sort of a research or sort of a study on the organization. Uh, did you do some somewhat of that exercise? Of course. As yeah. I said, I worked for 10, 11 years before that in the central bank. So when I came in, I immediately studied the situation. What were your findings? What were the setbacks, weaknesses, and what were, what were the strengths? And what actions have you taken to uh, reinforce the strengths and eradicate weaknesses? Okay. So basically, there were some very critical changes, Mahesh, which I was very concerned about. First of all, we had a legal and compliance department in the old days in the central bank. This did not exist when I became governor in January this year. That was very strange. It did, not it did not exist. We did not have a legal and compliance department, which in any bank is a basic function of any banking institution. On what grounds? It had been suppressed. Why? All the lawyers in the bank had been dispersed to different departments and we did not have a legal function. Mr. Mahendra, may I request a repeat? Uh, on yes, the, same answer? the central bank did not have a legal department. Did not have a legal department? That's right. And this is one thing that I was shocked when I came in. The central bank of Sri Lanka didn't have a legal department? No, we did not. And we were relying on outside lawyers. On what Who grounds? were being paid huge amounts of money to do our legal work. Which means your important legal documents were with outsiders? Well, uh, they had access to those legal documents. And the lawyers in the bank who had been hired by the bank were being asked to do human resources and all sorts of other activities. Their, their legal competence was not being utilized properly. Well, when you were in central bank yes. for, in your first tenure, in 11 years, yes. was there a legal department? Of course. It was a very important department. Who did we had very uh, senior and highly respected lawyers who were working for us. And who, we still do. Who did disband this legal department? Or when, it, when, it bec when did it become null and void? I think it happened sometime in the last 10 years. On the grounds? On what grounds? I have no idea. Okay, go ahead. So, that was the main thing I was concerned about. And, as you know, the but bank has... Have you taken to... So, we are now reinstating, as I speak, we have just appointed the new head of the legal department, a uh, very senior, seasoned uh, uh, officer who has done legal studies, who will now head this department. And all the legally trained people in the bank will be brought together once again under the legal function so that the lawyers in the bank can now start uh, effecting all the regulations and the uh, classification and control rules which govern the way the bank's procedures should operate. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me ponder further or let me rather question uh, on that issue. Yes. Now, you identified that as a weakness. Yes. And we have a fair, a fair perception that uh, the senior hierarchy at that time would have had some sort of expertise somewhat similar to what you have. Well, there would have been a couple of people and yes. there was an economist hired from, uh, from a European country. Uh, why didn't they understand, why didn't they recognize it as a weakness of not having a legal department within the central bank of uh, Sri Lanka? This is a mystery to me, Mahesh. I mean, I really don't know how this happened, but any uh, respectable international bank who, who was, always who was has the a finance legal... minister at that time? The finance minister was uh, actually the president of this country. Uh, Deputy Finance Minister? Deputy Finance Minister, I think there was Dr. Sarah Tamunagama and there was Ranjit Siamla Piti subsequently. These are people who were overseeing the central bank's activities at that time. They could have decided that legal department was not required. Presumably. What do you think? Do well, you I think department? it was a, a big risk for the bank because, as you know, we, uh, the central bank of Sri Lanka had to face lots of inquiries during that time on the hedging uh, deal with, for the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation on the investment in Greek bonds and on the hosting of the Commonwealth Games. There were several issues that the central bank was well, charged this is, the, this is the first time I heard this story. Uh, even, in a, even in a small scale financial company, even in a small scale uh, organization or SME, uh, they try to form a legal department and especially in a financial organization, legal department is a, is a must, it's a compulsory, it's an essential entity. When it comes to compliance, it's essential. Uh, feature, essential department, essential item in the structure. Yes. Mr. Mahendran, with all due respect to you, I'm, I'm very much surprised and disappointed 
as a member, as a citizen of this country, to know that there has not been a legal department uh, uh, in the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And uh, I will further carry out this investigation. Uh, we will find it out. And it's a surprise. And more surprise when it, when it comes from, from you as the new governor that you have found. One of the biggest weaknesses was that the, there wasn't a uh, legal department. Let's That's move on. Okay. So then we, I also found that the training function, uh, training in a central bank is very essential, Mahesh. As you know, we produce PhDs and uh, economists and, you know, people with uh, a lot of uh, detailed education so who can help the country in formulating policies in terms of spreading uh, economic development through the country, etc. Now that training function, again, had been merged with the human resources function. Earlier we had a separate training department and we had a separate human resources department. That function, both those functions had been merged, which I think was a move uh, uh, backwards. It was a step backwards because as a consequence, the training needs of the central bank have not been adequately addressed uh, mm -hmm. over the last decade or so. That's the second area. That's that the second found. area. The third area, and this is of course a more modern development, is what is called risk management. Oh. Now the central bank of Sri Lanka has very uh, onerous responsibilities given by the government which is uh, managing the employees provident fund that is 1.4 trillion rupees of money that is be being managed by the central bank on behalf of all the employees of sri lanka who contribute to that fund now to see that that fund is properly managed you should have an independent risk management function that oh. is standard pr procedure in any international fund or international there's bank. no point having a risk management uh uh, entity if it's not independent. Exactly. It has to be totally independent of the management of the fund. Oh. That is the standard procedure. Now again, that function did not exist in the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. When we were managing Greek bonds and all these types of risky investments, there was no independent audit or risk function looking at how these investments were being made. So that was the third area which I felt really should have been looked at more deeply. Uh -huh. So in summary, there were three critical functions that were not existing in the central bank when I took duties. The legal and compliance function, the most important, was not there. Absence of a department. Absence of department. Training is not being satisfactorily focused on. And thirdly, you're not having a risk management to see that the huge amounts of funds that are being managed by the central bank on behalf of the government and the people of Sri Lanka are not being uh, looked at in a properly risk-adjusted manner. Well, uh, Mr. Mahendra, are you the only non-Sri Lankan uh, governor of the central bank uh, after the independence, in the post-independence era? Not at all. The central bank of Sri Lanka was established by an American gentleman, Mr. John Exter, who came here in uh, 1949 and wrote the Monetary Law Act, which enabled the central bank to be set up. Mr. John Exter was a very well-renowned uh, economist from uh, the United States. He worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is the largest and the most influential Federal Reserve Bank in the U.S. And I think on account of his skills, he was asked to come here and set up the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. And he was the, rather the, uh, let's put it this way, he's the founder of the post-independent Central Bank of Sri Lanka, That's right. or the chairman of uh, the Central Bank. The governor. After the governor. Governor of the Central Bank after the independence. That's right. And he, he, was, he was completely U.S. citizen. That's right. But in your case, you have lived in this country for the last 50 years or so, yes. you said. So. Yes. Well, uh, don't you like to be a Sri Lankan citizen again? Of course I do. In fact, I want to apply for my Sri Lankan citizenship. There's a small problem, which is that my passport is not in my position anymore. So until that comes back, I'll have to wait. Well, does the, does the governor of the, uh, should the governor of the central bank sign on currencies? Of course. The governor of the central bank and the minister of finance have traditionally signed the currency notes of Sri Lanka. That is what makes it legal tender. Can I, can I see your signature, please? Certainly. This is your signature. That is my signature. This is the signature that you use. That's right. That's my normal signature. This is a 5,000 rupee note. It is, yes. This carries your signature. Yes. This carries your signature. That carries my signature. And this is a 5,000 rupee note signed by the new finance minister, Ravi Karunayaka, and Mr. Arjuna Mahendran. And here I see the signature, the signature just now I took from Mr. Mahendran. Yes. Is this valid? 
it is perfectly valid. But there's a rumor that uh, you uh, that your signature is not valid. That you are the you, you are a governor who has signed uh, the currency notes uh, in English after 27 years. That is complete rubbish, uh, Dr. Chinas Karnatilaka, who was governor when I was working in the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, signed his signature in English, and those currency notes were perfectly valid. There is nothing to prevent anybody signing in English or Sinhala or Tamil. The main criterion adopted is that you should use your usual signature so that it can be verified in a court of law. And that is what I did. I signed it in English. It is valid. I have been appointed by His Excellency the President as Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. There is nothing barring any foreigner from being appointed to that post under the laws of this country. And therefore that currency note is valid. Well, it's a time that we need to understand as public members of the public citizen of this country, we should understand who takes us on a right, whether the professionals or the politicians. I asked that question because, uh, quite impromptu, a uh, lot of politicians, a certain section of politicians came out with the fact that uh, you sign in, uh, in English and uh, you're not a Sri Lankan and a question of validity of, uh, of currency notes signed by you. Pathetic, but we have to sail through. Well, uh, now for the public, the central bank is about transparency, is about accountability. Public do not do transactions with central bank. Mm -hmm. So central bank is the apex body that governs, the, that runs the entire financial landscape in this country. Now from your answers and what we heard during the past five, six years, there has not been proper code of ethics transparent transparency issues issues with regards to accountability so many things has happened what steps would you all take to win back the public confidence the confidence of the people of this country and also to do the right thing to implement right or proper sophisticated policies in the best interest of this country in the best interest of the economy and in the interest of the people of this country the first thing i think we have to do mahesh is to establish that the central bank is not being run on political lines. So uh, I think the role of the governor in a normal central bank anywhere around the world is that of a person who keeps a fairly low profile, but on the other hand, when he makes a statement, makes statements of great authority and also statements that basically establish the financial stability and the economic stability of the country. And we should restrict our activities to those types of roles. I think uh, the, one of the problems with the central bank in the last decade is it has grown too large in terms of its visibility and the types of uh, pronouncements that it makes. Uh -huh. And we have to now come back and really focus on our core business. And the core business of a central bank is to ensure the financial soundness of the Sri Lankan financial system and also to see that price stability and economic development takes place. Uh -huh. So that is one very essential thing. I think the public has got used to a central bank that is too bombastic and too involved in the limelight yes. of politics. Yes. That should not be the case. Well, now we, we see, at least for the time being, yes. you stick to your realm of responsibilities, yes. to your professional domain. But your uh, the predecessors, or the previous uh, uh, the management, we saw that they were in the limelight, they were in the public eye. Public may, uh, end of this year, may, may will have a perception, or even the, uh, your, the political uh, uh, the opportunist may come up and say, look, we don't know where the central bank governor is, he's, he's sleeping, he's not to be seen. Because we are used to a, we are used to a governor who, who, uh, who should associate with the higher, higher echelons, uh, uh, with the higher, higher ups, with the top uh, the top notch politicians that's what we are used to last 10 years uh, your post uh, accompanied yeah. a lot of privileges a lot of political power and uh, the, the 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 post of the governor was portrayed as a person who holds sway in in, in many areas yes so if that happens to you would you regret or, or or you want to stick to your professional domain and keep a low profile my preference is to stick to my professional domain and that is the way I think a central bank should be run. And if you look around you in the world, that is the way central banks are run. The problem when you get involved in the political uh, way of doing things is that, and we see the results of that in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka in the last 10 years has borrowed too much in the international markets. Today, Mahesh, we are in a situation where we can't borrow anymore. We have exhausted 
our borrowing limit. We are like a person who has got a credit card who now has taken the full limit of the credit card and can't repay the debts. That is our problem. The taxes that we are raising in Sri Lanka are not enough to service the debts that we have taken in the past. This is the pathetic situation that we are facing today. And the Honorable Minister of Finance and the Cabinet are trying to resolve these issues. That is why some of the projects that are being done have slowed down. But of course, we can improve the situation and that will be done. Basically, we have to raise the way we collect taxes. We have to examine that whole situation. And the role of the central bank at the end of the day is not to follow blindly the political agenda of the government, but to advise the government where it is going wrong and to show the, how those uh, problems can be resolved in a constructive manner. That is my view of how a central bank should be run. Well, I think uh, the newly appointed governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka will have to work a lot to put his house in order. Let's take a break. Welcome back. We move into the last portion of Nadua. I'm talking to uh, this gentleman, Mr. Arjuna Mahendra. Uh, he is the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He explained to us uh, from the very outset of this program about himself and about how this treasury bond issuance uh, fiasco took place and his personal opinion, the weaknesses and the strengths that he uh, found or he rather researched uh, at the Central Bank and what uh, remedial actions that they are going to take place. Well, Mr. Mahindran, after all, now the brunt of responsibilities is in your hands. You are the man who is responsible to run this organization properly. We see in 2007, Central Bank was severely criticized by many international agencies. Uh, even uh, uh, even uh, international agencies lowered uh, the ranking or the credit ranking of the Central Bank. And uh, in 2010, 2011 and 2012, uh, there were uh, borrowing of uh, funds at higher rates. Uh, that impacted on the rupee and the net result of that was a rupee which was at 110 shot up to 130. We are suffering because of these decisions. Shouldn't you all review these decisions and take immediate action whatsoever? It could be short term or long term in order to rehabilitate our financial landscape. You see, uh, I know it's a uphill task. It is it an uphill, uphill task, task, Mahesh, but also remember that we can't open the country to unnecessary danger. Now, there have been cases in the past, I will mention the case of Italy and Greece in the recent past, where the GDP numbers, by their own admission, were, were reported to be false. And they drastically revised their GDP numbers downwards. As a result, those two countries got into massive financial difficulties. Now, Sri Lanka should not go down that path. I think the, so far the GDP numbers have not been questioned and I think they are reasonably accurate. So I want to nail down any issues about the statistics that Sri Lanka issues and those type of uh, uh, concepts uh, because I think it will damage the country if we go down that route. Oh. And as far as I'm aware, there's really no issue down that route. The staff of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, of the Census Department have done their work properly. It's only the management of the government that has, I think, caused some issues in the past. That is the first point. The second point I want to make is that we have to look at the future. This country has tremendous strengths. The main strength is the quality of its people. And it's not difficult to turn this country around. As I said, we are like a person with a credit card who has maxed out on his credit card and can't repay his debts. We have to change the situation fast. Now, we have one big advantage. Our Sri Lankan workers who have gone overseas, like myself, uh -huh. are sending massive amounts of money back to Sri Lanka. Last year, $7 billion came officially uh -huh. into the country. I think three times that amount actually came through unofficial sources in the Hawala and other types of markets into the country. Now, our total GDP is $70 billion. Uh, uh, so if $7 billion is coming through official channels, imagine how big that component of money is. We have to encourage those Sri Lankans living overseas, whether they are Tamils, Burgers, Sinhalese, all these people to come back to Sri Lanka because of the new policies of Yahapalane and, you know, getting the whole country together to be united as a united Sri Lanka. That is very important for the economy because once people have that confidence that they can get a fair deal, that they don't have to go and pay somebody money to get the job done, that they can get it as a natural right, 
on a fair basis. Those are the simple things that will make this country go ahead. So I would rather focus on those, on the future, rather than harping on the past and trying to dig out all this political mud, which, as I said, is not the job of the central bank. That can be done by our political masters, and they can do that in their own time. But I consider my job in the central bank to lay the basis for this new economy that is based on foreign inflows of remittances, eventually encourage more foreign investment, all that to really allow the Sri Lankan economy to take off. Yet, Mr. Governor, the public has a right to know what has happened in the past. And if there, if there, had, if there has been any losses that the public cannot tolerate, yes. uh, the perpetrators should be brought to book. And at least there should be public announcement of what activities, what actions were, uh, were, were executed. Yes. And the result of that, one such result uh, uh, is in 2011, as I said, how, how rupee was depreciated yes. because of a borrowing of 2.7 billion uh, US dollars. Yes. Uh, so... Shouldn't you divulge or shouldn't you come out with this information so that the public will be further educated? Otherwise, you, otherwise uh, some politician will again hold the wrong end of the stick and will blame you. That's a very valid point. I think we have to definitely uh, do some research on the recent economic history of Sri Lanka and uh, draw some proper conclusions on where mistakes were made. Now, I don't want to make this a blame game. I don't want to you know, pinpoint individuals and politicians and people like that. I think we should look at this objectively. And we are doing that. We will uh, study the recent economic history of the country and come to the appropriate conclusions and then see where we can learn from those mistakes. You are absolutely right. Having a fixed exchange rate during the years just after the war was, I think, a mistake. And we paid dearly for that in terms of a one-time 25% devaluation of the rupee, which affected a lot of common people and their living standards. So we should avoid that. As you know, now we have a flexible exchange rate, which has been moving uh, in the recent weeks as the dollar has strengthened against all global currencies. The Sri Lanka rupee also has depreciated about 2% oh. against the US dollar. Yeah. That is uh, actually quite mild. The oh. Japanese yen, for instance, has fallen about 25% oh. against the US dollar. The euro has fallen more than 25% against the dollar. So we have managed to hold it at a reasonable level of about 2%, and we will keep the currency flexible. That is one of the lessons that we can learn. But as I said, it is not the job of the central bank to apportion blame. That is for the courts of law, and that is for parliament to do. And I don't consider that the duty of the central bank. We will definitely uh, you know, look at the lessons learned and bring those into the public domain. Uh, we will get all the experts, we will consult all the experts, and try and do an objective job of that. Well, understood. Now, uh, since we spoke about the deposition of rupee, uh, we understand that one way of encouraging exports is 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 uh, allowing the market uh, variables to work, and so the price of the rupee will be decided by the market forces. Yes. But while it will have a, a advantages or major uh, advantage to the exporters, uh, it is also a disadvantage to the importers. Right. And we are a country which uh, live on imported goods, uh, unlike uh, many other countries. Right. So shouldn't uh, C uh, CBSL, uh, the central bank, uh, review uh, the current position and change its stance slightly uh, in order to avert any danger or any risk of uh, 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 rising cost of living? You see, we are in a difficult position at the moment, Mahesh, because the country has overborrowed. And we really need foreign currency uh, urgently to see that the finances of the government and of the country remain on a stable path. And that regrettably means that at a time when the US dollar is getting strong all over the world, Sri Lanka cannot buck that trend and go in a different direction. That will be suicide. We have to see that our currency remains competitive. Our garment exports, our tea exports have to remain competitively priced against Vietnam, who is exporting tea and garments, Indonesia, who is exporting tea and garments, Kenya, who is exporting tea and garments. All these countries are competing against us. And we have to see that our currency does not stand in the way of uh, being able to compete effectively with all those countries. That is the nature of the global market. We can't run away from that. So that is the only message I can give you in answer to that. The reason for reason for allowing market forces to determine the rupee is the fact that we have uh, overborrowed. That's right. Well, uh, we generally anyway look at the market forces in determining the, the rupee, even in normal circumstances. But in this particular situation where we have overborrowed, it, it assumes even more importance that we remain competitive on our export front. 
Well, uh, another important aspect uh, uh, we discussed uh, during the previous uh, uh, government, yes. uh, last two or three years, is the consolidation of smaller scale financial organizations. I, I think it's a timely question to ask from you. Uh, will the new management uh, pursue the same uh, platform, the same plan, same strategy of, uh, of implementing consolidation amongst the financial companies in, no, in order to avert any danger of falling uh, financial organizations? So once again, Mahesh, you know, the, under the previous government, this whole policy was uh, uh, sort of evolved within the central bank. And uh, I don't think it was uh, given enough consultation amongst a larger audience. What the new government has done is they have thrown open the debate to a wider audience. And uh, we have got the report of the Dinesh Virakodi committee, which has said that instead of forcing consolidation, we should do it on a voluntary basis. If two companies or two banks, two finance companies or two banks decide that they want to merge, that's fine. We can encourage that to happen. But it is not the, the policy of this new government to force these units to merge because we have found some very unfortunate situations uh, in the past where companies were forced to merge. And when you merge a good company, a well-managed company with a badly managed company, you can end up with the whole thing becoming rotten. And that is the danger, I think, that we faced in the past. So the new policy is to go more on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. uh, given uh, all these uh, uh, dynamics in the market and uh, the uh, recent uh, incidents, uh, shouldn't you have a uh, more sound sort of a department or an entity within the central bank mm -hmm. uh, to help out the companies which are in a restructuring process mm -hmm. or which are ailing finance companies? Shouldn't Please. you hire the experts and uh, sort of uh, get into the ground and do pragmatic, carry out pragmatic uh, uh, tools or approaches in order to help in these companies? I know why you're asking that question, Mahesh, because there is a perception that the central bank has dropped the ball in terms of how it handles some of these failed finance companies. Uh, names like Golden Key come to mind. Now, it is very regrettable that these situations have arisen. What I can assure you is we have the best professional competent staff in the central bank to handle these situations. The issue is, were they given the proper directions by the management to go and fix these problems. And from my perspective, that was not the case. So now we will get these people. As I said, we have formed a new legal department, which is a very critical department to handle the legal aspects of the restructuring of finance companies. So they will now focus on that aspect and see that it is done properly. And I'm sure that within the next few months, Mahesh, you will see some results which will prove that there's a new way of handling these crises in the future. When it comes to uh, managing finances and monetary policies of a country and managing a huge network of uh, banks and the branches of these bankers, banks, uh, the IT governance is, is, is very much uh, required. That's right. uh, haven't you all thought of that in, up, in terms of upgrading the current IT uh, governance? Uh, we hear and we see some actions uh, uh, has happened in the past and some new uh, uh, innovation or novelty is going to be introduced. Uh, what are your thoughts in, in this? That's a very good question. Uh, we have uh, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, one of the issues that I saw when I came here, were two parallel systems for transferring funds amongst banks. There is a, a system that is run by Sampath Bank, which has about 10 other banks as its members, and they say that their costs of transactions are much lower. Whereas Lanka Clear, which is a company that was originally actually set up by me when I used to work in the central bank uh, 20 odd years ago, uh, that company uh, has a separate system which involves all the other banks, the remaining banks. And these two have not been talking to each other, which I think is a, uh, you know, a general, uh, generally to the disadvantage of the banking public. Mm. So I have spoken to all the bank uh, CEOs and asked them whether we can bring these two together and have a seamless situation where you and I can go to any ATM of any bank and withdraw funds from our bank. Say, if I have an account in the Bank of Ceylon, I should be able to go to a commercial bank ATM, withdraw funds from my account in the Bank of Ceylon, and ideally not even be charged for that transaction. At the moment, there's a charge of about 30 rupees or or something like that. So I have urged the banks to look at a system where for the public's benefit all these types of IT related issues can be harmoniously resolved without any burden on the public. That is one thing. The second point is as you say we have to see that the security of our IT systems is looked at 
This is one area which I am concerned about. Oh. Because some of our banks are so small, they are unable to invest in the necessary knowledge and the infrastructure to see that the IT systems are properly uh, secured. So that is top priority, and we are looking at that at a, on an uh, industry-wide basis to see that our systems come up to scratch. And thirdly, uh, we have to engage with the American, the U.S. authorities, and other big uh, global regulators to see that the transfer of funds between Sri Lanka and other countries is made more efficient. There are several laws that have to be recognized in Sri Lanka which have not been done. And also some of the central banks are asking us to join their uh, IT networks so that payments, say we have a big population of workers in the Middle East. Mm. If we join up with the Saudis and the Qataris and the, and the UAE central bank to see that payments can be made directly where uh, some worker in the Middle East, a Sri Lankan worker coming back home can withdraw funds from an ATM without having to pay any money from their account in Saudi or wherever, that would be a great advantage. So we have to look at those sorts of interconnections also. So that is our plan for the next few years to try and make these a reality. Well, uh, uh, throughout your, uh, this interview, what I, fathom is, what I fathom was that you want to focus on the core area that the central bank is responsible for. Uh, in layman's language, we, we, have, we have seen that central bank indulging in offshore activities as well in the past, uh, getting involved in investments, getting involved in uh, uh, creating investment zones and so on and so forth. What will be your position, what will be your stance with regards to that? Well, the central bank has a duty to see that the economy of Sri Lanka develops. So to that extent, you know, central bank will definitely keep engaging with the government to see that proper policies are followed and we will act as an impartial advisor. So we will stand away from the government and if necessary, we will, when we see something going wrong or some policy which we think is not appropriate, the central bank will make the government uh, aware of that. So that I think is very important. There should be that independence. The independence of the central bank is very critical. This is a global trend. Because central banks have to ensure that inflation does not get out of control. And in Sri Lanka, there is a danger that if we keep raising public sector salaries and you know, doing all these types of spending without any proper controls, we will end up in a high inflation situation at some point in the future. So that is our primary function. And we will exercise our duty to see that that does not happen. Then, of course, there are other issues like the overborrowing by the government, the lack of tax collection by the government. These are critical issues that have to be addressed. And we continue to point these out to the government so that we are independent and we act as a constructive advisor to the government to rectify these problems. Well, is CBSL equipped to, full, equipped to fulfill the promises given by uh, my three Ranil uh, combination that brought in uh, uh, good governance-based political uh, culture to this country? Well, um, as I said, uh, we have changed one little corner of the financial world in Sri Lanka by moving to a more transparent system of issuing government securities. Without having privately placed uh, government bonds, we now have transparent auctions. That, I think, is a very vital first step, which uh, shows our good faith and our determination to see that you know, the entire financial system moves towards a more transparent, market-friendly environment, which will then allow the economy to function in a better manner and also will attract more confidence in our system when investors both in Sri Lanka and overseas see that there are proper auctions where prices are published on a weekly basis, they will also get confidence that this market is functioning properly. So that is our little contribution towards the Maitri Ranil concept of Yahapalane. Mr. Mahendran, yes. final question to you. We appreciate the fact that you accepted uh, the post of the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and we are happy to see an eminent person in that post. My question is, what will be the legacy that you will leave the day that you are leaving this post? The legacy, Mahesh, that we should, I would like to see is first and foremost for the future generations of this country. I want to see that our children and our grandchildren have a Sri Lanka which is not overborrowed, which does not have too much debt, which they will have to pay, their generation will have to pay the debts of their grandparents. I don't want that to be the situation. I want to see that the future generations will have a Sri Lanka where the government collects enough taxes so that it can repay these debts effectively and thereby create a stable situation for Sri Lanka where the economy can develop 
without the the baggage of the past holding the country behind that to me if we can achieve some of that in the next few years this would be i think a great achievement and i hope i can make a contribution to that well thank you very much mr mahendran for joining with us we wish you good luck and we hope that you will be able to uh, continue the good work and uh, serve this nation and serve us thank you very much mahesh thank you very much thank you very much friends for watching us and await more interesting episodes on nadu good night to you